Most of us know Johnny Gilbert as the iconic announcer of Jeopardy. But I had the chance to speak with him about his early days as a professional singer, his time spent traveling and performing in the U.S. Army, and some of the many shows he worked on before becoming the legendary voice of Jeopardy. Johnny reflects on his career highlights, the friendships he's made along the way, including with beloved actress Betty White, and he shares some of his fondest memories with Alex Trebek. Please enjoy my special interview with Johnny Gilbert. Johnny, you have had such an impressive career in entertainment, but I want you to take us back to where it all began, Newport News, Virginia. Oh, boy, that is really taking you back. <laughs> but that is where it all began, uh, boy, a long time ago. But, you know, it's a funny thing. I'm an only child, uh, and nobody in my family uh, had anything to do with show business at all. Uh, but I had a feeling for it right at the very beginning. I wanted to, I wanted to sing. That's what I wanted to be, a singer. From the way I understand it, you were first singing in your hometown Lutheran Church Choir. Is that correct? Of course I did, because my grandmother uh, went to that church, and so I went there, so I got in the choir. I guess that's where I really got the feeling that I liked singing, yeah, really. Uh, and then that's when I decided to get to try to get better at it and, and do more of it. And so I started taking singing lessons, you know. Uh, there was only one singing teacher in Newport News at that time, uh, and so I started taking lessons with him. He was also an opera teacher, so, and I knew nothing about opera, but it was a godsend because he taught me how to use the voice and the throat in ways that a normal pop singer would never even think about. And I would sing wherever I could. I, I sang at the USO for the troops. Uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, God, I must have been about 13 years old. Uh, that's you know how it just all came together in Newport News, little by little. And what was that feeling like for you when you would get on a stage or get at the top of the church and perform? What was it that you loved about it? Well, it was it's wonderful because I loved audiences. I always loved, uh, I was not afraid to sing or to speak or to be in a large group of people. Uh, that seemed to come natural to me for some reason or other, and I was really drawn to it. Uh, and I really didn't think much about the talking part of it at the time because singing was really on my mind, but it really was all a part of it. Uh, I would uh, get up in front of audiences and talk and without any fear or nervousness at all. And how old were you when you started working with that opera singer? Oh, golly, let's see. I was probably around 14. And I worked with him for, oh, I guess two years. He worked with me off and on. Uh, but that's really kind of where we, the whole thing started, you know. And it's so interesting that that type of training, like you said, was so different than someone would be trained as a pop star. And that that level that you were trained in really helped in all your areas of your career. It really did. He taught me how to use the voice, how to vocalize, how to uh, reach notes that normally you, I wouldn't really be thinking about being able to do because it's opera. he was an opera teacher, you know, so he wanted that to come out of all of his students. And he really pulled it out of me because opera, <laughs> I knew nothing about opera. <laughs> so you're in high school and you decide you want a career. You want to be a singer. You want to be in a band. I, you know, found this little group of uh, band people, and he said, okay, yeah, you, you know, we need a singer. We can use a singer. So, you know, I said, wonderful. Let me do that. So money was not an object at that point because they were poor and so was I. Um, but it gave me the experience that I needed to say, let's go on to the, in my mind, you know, let's, I want to do more. You know. But I sang with them, and we just sang around, but worked around the Newport News, the Hampton area, uh, on whatever gigs they would get. And that got me got me started for it. And I, I liked that. That was kind of fun. So then I kind of decided I would go a little bit further. And I, I read in a uh, newspaper that a big band, I wanted to sing with a big band. Big band was auditioning for singers. Happened to be in Jacksonville, Florida. But I got on a bus and rode all the way to Jacksonville, Florida, to audition for that band. And when I got there, they were gone. The uh, item in the newspaper was off on its dates. The band had already been there and had moved on so somewhere else. So I was stuck in Jacksonville, Florida, with no band to audition for. But I found out that there was an agent there 
a fellow by the name of Sam Four. I still remember his name. And he, I went to him and I told him my story and I told him that I wanted to sing and could he help me in any way. So he said, yes, I think I can. I have a nightclub on the outskirts of town and I need a, an MC and singer uh, for the show. Well, I didn't even know what MC was. He had explained to me that it was a master of ceremonies. And uh, so he taught me. He literally trained me. And we had a six-piece band there. So I got to where I was singing with the band again, and I'd done that before. So that kind of fell into play. And that's where it all started. And before you know it, you're traveling the country as a singing MC. That's right. At that time, there were supper clubs all across the country. Every city had one or two supper clubs, and they always used entertainers. So there was kind of a, a network of agents. They would work one area, and they would be in contact with agents from another area. So you could go from one place to the next. If you did well in one, you'd do, the agent says, yeah, he did a good job here. You might like him. So they would hire me, and I would go into the next city. No, I was just singing, yeah, and emceeing came naturally to me. And then I tried to expand on it, and I started doing impressions. I could do some impressions fairly well. So I built that into my act, and the audiences loved it. I used to do uh, Mario Lanza, the end of uh, one of his songs where he hits the high note at the end, and I built that into the act where I, and I said, get up to the last note, and then I'd say, and then he would hit that high B flat up there. <laughs> and then I said, well, let me try it, and then I would go ahead and do it. You know, that kind of stuff. So your career is really kind of taking off as a singer and an MC, and then here it is, the early 50s, and you're drafted into the Army. Right. I was drafted into the Army. Uh, they came in, as a matter of fact, I was working at a club in Nashville, Tennessee, when the boys came and said, you are going into the Army. You know, you had to sign up for it when you were 18. But once you did that, you know, you, you didn't think that much more about it. And it wasn't a, a big deal. So I... Uh, and I was working in a good club, too. I really liked where I was, and they had big signs out in front, Johnny Gilbert here, you know, that kind of a thing. So I was in my little heaven, you know. But so when they told me that I was being drafted, that was a shock. And it became more of a shock as I got out of my my nightclub world, and <laughs> our dinner club world, and into the world of carrying a gun and digging around in trenches and they take your name away and give you a number. And that becomes your name and everything. U.S. 530970003. You never forget it. Did you head straight into basic training then? Yeah. Yeah, right into basic training. In Baltimore, outside of Baltimore, Maryland. And I, while I was in training, uh, they were wanting to put some shows together. And I told them that I was a singer, an MC. So they put me in and they built a show with me and other entertainers that were also drafted. And we did USO shows while I was doing basic training. As a matter of fact, that's how I got there because the cap my captain during basic training loved the shows that we did. He thought I did a good job. He said, John, I don't think you I think you should be in the entertainment area. Uh, let me uh, let me see if I can arrange that. So he did. He arranged an appointment for me, and I went from there to Washington, D.C., to the Pentagon, to talk to a major. I told him my captain had sent me there to see him, what I did, and so forth. And he arranged for me to go to the uh, entertainment school in, Fort, uh, in Indianapolis, Indiana. And uh, I was there for eight weeks. And then, then I was... Uh, do like everybody else to be shipped out but because i was in the entertainment unit when i was shipped out i was shipped out the korean war was going on then but we also had people in germany so they shipped me to germany which was another lucky break and i was there i guess about four weeks when they called me up and they said we're doing this show and we're getting entertainers together to do it and we're having different people uh, come from all the different branches of the service uh, and audition for different parts. And, the, and I didn't know the writers at that time. There was two writers. One wrote lyrics and the other wrote the book. And um, and the music, rather. And um, I met them and talked with them. And they said they wanted me to try out for the lead in it. Which was a shock to me. And I still didn't know how big it was. Well, it ended up, we had, uh, gosh, we had about 20-some people in this cast altogether. It was the story of Marco Polo. The story of Marco Polo. We traveled uh, and we performed mainly in theaters, you know, 
wherever the theaters were in the different towns and so forth, and then on bases, army bases, navy bases, wherever they were located around in Germany. So obviously the the army and navy bases were all extremely enthusiastic. They were all GIs and any kind of entertainment they were happy about. And it was a good show. We had good music in it. The writers did a good job of creating the show. Uh, and then we we would perform for the German audiences. And while a lot of them weren't sure of what the language <laughs> meant or anything like that, they liked the music. So it was well received. And that's why it lasted as long as it did. It must have been so rewarding, though, to be a part of something positive. Well, that's what a lot of the, uh, you know, a lot of the, uh, the Army brass and Navy brass came to the show. Uh, different uh, generals and people like that. And they would come backstage after the show and tell us how much uh, we en they enjoyed it. But more than that, what a good thing it was for us to have this show traveling around uh, uh, Europe. So we knew that the people really liked it because it was not a, it was an up, happy musical, you know, it was yeah. all music. And it was a happy show with a happy ending and everything. It was all built that way. And it was it received that way. So, yes, I think it did probably lift a lot of spirits. Wow. So you go from Nashville, Tennessee, singing and emceeing, and months later, you're in Germany and you're starring in a traveling performance for the service. So all of a sudden, this horrible thoughts of being on the front line with a gun never entered my mind. As a matter of fact, they give you a, an interesting side point. You know, when, you're, when you go into the service, at that point anyway, they issue you a gun. You have a rifle. And that's your rifle. Wherever you go, you have that rifle is with you. And when I got into the entertainment thing, I had turned in my rifle. You know, gave it to them. I didn't turn it. I gave it to them because I wouldn't carry it around with me. I never thought any more about it until it was time for me to come back from Germany. And I was told then that I had produced the rifle. And I had no idea. This was a year and a half later. I finally was able to track it down through my base camp. And it was in a storage area in Munich, Germany. And I got the rifle back. <laughs> I tell you, when I look back on this, the good Lord was sitting on my shoulder, somebody was, to get me through all of that. So how did your time in the service then end up coming to a close? Well, I was up, you know, you have two years. And when you're up for two years, you can re-up on your own or you can leave the service. And at that point, uh, Zanadu had been running for quite some time and it was ending. And so I, there was no reason for me to stay in the service because I, I wanted to get back into civilian life. I wanted to get back into clubs and to performing, singing uh, on my own, as I had done before, because I had been a success at it in my own status at any rate. So I was looking for that and uh, looking forward to it. So I went back into entertaining again. I entertained all around, including New Orleans. Uh, and uh, WDSU is a station in New Orleans, and I uh, got booked on that as a singer. And I loved that. I thought that was sensational. You like you know, television. Oh, my God, did I like it. I, I saw what it could do, how far it could reach. Uh, what on, it was a, like a magic thing. The whole thing was a, like a miracle. So at this point, you're you're ready for the big city. You decide, I'm going to head to New York City you find an agent, you get signed with William Morris Agency, and you receive your first job on national television. Tell me about that. Yep. They sent me up to uh, be interviewed, audition really, interviewed for the job uh, of a, a show that was going to replace a, a, one of the hit shows on NBC. And this was just a 13-week daytime replacement. That's what, uh, not a daytime, nighttime replacement. That's what it was going to be. And the show was called Music Bingo. And they were looking for somebody that could both sing and host the show. And I won the audition. I won the interview. I was selected. The show was only on for 13 weeks on NBC. And then the other show, and I can't remember what it was that we'd replaced, comes back on for the fall and through the season. But in the meantime, uh, Bud Grant, who was a VP at ABC, saw the show on the air, knew that it was only going to be on for a long time, and ABC was getting ready to set up a daytime network. They, didn't have, they only had prime time, but they wanted to set up a daytime setup, shows during the day. And one of them was a show that, uh, one of them was a, a half-hour game show that they wanted. And they liked music bingo. 
So they went to the producer of the program, a fellow by the name of Harry Salter, and uh, tell him, told him that uh, they would be interested in it for daytime. So he sold it to them, got it on the air, and we went on the air on ABC. As soon as we finished NBC, about two weeks later, we were on the air on ABC, daytime. Who would have thought there would be a show that would combine singing and hosting? Music bingo, there couldn't have been a better job for you. Absolutely. I, I can't tell you. I just, just, <laughs> it's uh, almost amazing. Just almost amazing. I, I love the show, and... Uh, People would, uh, the contestant would come on stage and we'd play parts of a song. It was really a takeoff on Name That Tune. Harry just made a daytime version of it and called <laughs> it Music Bingo. That's what he did. And the first one that hit their button, if they could name the tune, they would get B-I-N-G-O or pick out a letter to put on the board. The first one that got bingo won. Just as simple as that. And people at home liked it, so they did a home game. At the end of the show, we did a home game for the folks just at home. And that got a tremendous response. So, it was, you know, it couldn't have been better for me, really. And the irony of it all, the irony of it all is that my wife's mother used to play the home game of bingo. <laughs> is that weird? Long before she knew her daughter was going to be married to Johnny Gilbert himself. <laughs> she was still in Tennessee. And I was in New York doing this show. Had no idea. But... Ironic, I guess. I don't know. Yeah. And because of Music Bingo, your music and your albums, you know, your music became popular. You actually were releasing and recording albums and singles, right? Yeah. Cut two albums. Cut two different albums based on Music Bingo. And they did quite well. I mean, not smash hits, but they did quite well from the viewer's standpoint. So that kind of solidified me as a, a host singer, I guess, down the line. What brought Music Bingo to an end? It all was going so well. Oh, there were so many different things that were popular at that time. But back in those days, they had a, a big scandal, a $64,000 question. The, uh, they found out, that leaked, the word leaked out, that if producers liked a contestant on the game, they would give them some of the answers to keep them on the game because they were liked by the audience. Because these shows were live, and they'd get feedback from the audiences. And so they'd keep the contestant on a little bit longer by giving them some of the answers. Well, that's obviously a no-no. So when that came out, the FCC went through the ceiling, and they pulled every game show on the network off the air. Name that tune, uh, my show, Music Bingo, uh, 21. There were two or three other shows that were connected one way or another that they weren't proven that anybody was doing anything wrong. But because of this scandal, they won't take them all off. So they canceled all the shows. But never fear, Johnny's chapter is just beginning. He gets a movie role in 1961. You're, you're in Gidget Goes Hawaiian. Now you're doing movies, Johnny. Would you believe that? <laughs> As a nightclub MC in one of the scenes. And if you watch the movie, you'll see me in it. My manager in New York, I had a man, another manager at that time, and he, he, has, his, he had... Two other managers that worked with him. One worked in Chicago and the other one worked in L.A. And so the manager in New York, uh, Sam, said to, uh, to our manager in Hollywood, do you think Johnny might work on one of the movies or something? Is that possible? So they brought me out to California to see if maybe I could get into the movies. They would have me audition for different things. Well, uh, movies were not for me. The only thing I got was that one particular little role. But that's okay. It introduced me to California, and I fell in love with California. And I knew that I wanted to be here. Now, when was it that you hosted the Johnny Gilbert Show in Ohio? Ah, okay. I did the Johnny Gilbert Show when I was in New York doing various uh, shows. And then my manager came to me, and he said, Johnny, they are looking for a host of a daytime show like the Mike Douglas show, a variety show, live, every day, five days a week, the Johnny Gilbert show, a one-hour music show with a band, my singing, guests, all kinds of guests that would come in through Dayton for nightclubs and other things, people that are any renown at all for acting and so forth, we would pull them in, get them on the show. 
I was running my own show. I had my own staff and offices and so forth. It was a whole different ball game, and it was hard work. It really was. That's not an easy thing to do, <laughs> and it's and you got to make all of the stations happy with what you're doing. And we did it, and we are up for renewal at the end of two years. Uh, and but I was tired. I was really tired. The show was doing well. They were ready to renew the show, uh, but my. I've been talking to my manager, and I told him, I said, this isn't going into syndication. And, oh, by the way, the five stations that they had, they sold two of them. Oh, no. <laughs> so the syndication thing went out the window. So now here I am with a successful show in Dayton, Ohio. It ain't going anywhere but Dayton, Ohio. And I told my manager, I said, geez, I just don't want to do this. And I really don't. I mean, I'll have to if, if I don't have another job. He said, well, there's a, there's a show called um, Celebrity Fast Draw, a game show that's being put together by a company here in New York. And I think I may get you on as the host of the show if you'd like to do that. So were game shows kind of coming back at that point, kind of yes. having a resurgence? Yes, and they and this was all, now syndication was such a big thing and they wanted to do this for syndication. So it would work or it wouldn't work, but it was a pretty good company, so they had a good chance at it. So rather than renew my show in Dayton, Ohio, I said, thank you, folks, and fun. I didn't get into syndication. I'm going to go back to New York and see if I can get into syndication with the show. And that's what I did. I left, picked up, took my family, went back to New York City, and we did a pilot for the show. And they got enough stations bought that they put it into production. What would happen is they stood behind a board plate glass on each side, celebrities would, with me in the middle. And then I would give them a word or something, and they would have to draw on the inside of the wall through this little glass. They'd have to draw while the other celebrity watched what they were drawing. And they would have to guess what the answer was by what they were drawing. That's why it was called Fast Draw. And they only had a certain amount of time to do it. When I finished Fast Draw, the... the uh, my manager was looking for another job for me. Um, but, uh, you know, in the meantime, uh, uh, there wasn't that much to do and so forth. And then I got a chance to come to California because I'd met a guy in New York by the name of Bob Stivers. And uh, he had created a new special, a two-hour television special. And I had done some run-throughs for him of games that he was trying to sell and didn't sell. I did a lot of run-throughs in my life. <laughs> uh, and he called me and he said, uh, John, I'm going to do this show. We're doing it in California. It's called People's Choice Awards. Um, and I'd like for you to come out and host it and, and uh, announce it. And I did. I did. I came out and did that show. Had no idea what it be. It still goes on. It still goes even today. A game show called Press Your Luck is the one that really solidified my staying in California because that was a show that was syndicated uh, by Bing Crosby Productions and it had a lot of money behind it. Um, so that brought me to California. We went into syndication with that for a year and uh, then from there I just kind of moved from one thing to another in California. It seems like this is the point in your career when you're iconic voice really started steering you towards a full-time career in announcing. As an announcer, yeah. Oh, yeah. I, well, I, you know, while I was in New York, also, also I did The Price is Right, you know, with Bill Cullen uh, when I was in New York before I came out here. Yeah, there's no bigger announcing job than that no, at the time, right? No, no, really. That was it. That was great. And so that kept my name in the business alive. What's that like when you get the call from Mark Goodson to replace Don Pardo as the announcer of The Price is Right. That was something. That was something. And Don Pardo taught me how to do The Price is Right. He had been doing it for years. And uh, he said, oh, Johnny, how you because it was live, you know. One day a week it was live and the rest of it was syndicated. So Don and I got to be good friends as a result of that. But when, when I did the things for Bob Stivers, uh, he was such a neat guy. He did all kinds of things. He wanted, to, he wanted to do another game show. So we did a lot of run-throughs on different game show ideas that he had. And then he created another special that I did several of called uh, Circus of the Stars. That was Bob Stivers, same guy that did People's Choice Awards. We went up to Las Vegas and did that show uh, up right at the uh, um, Caesars. 
And we'd bring all the celebrities. And these were big celebrities. If you remember the show, we had big names on there. And they would do all kinds of strange things, you know, aerial acts and so forth <laughs> like that. Things they never did before to get on this show because it was so highly rated. And that was quite an experience. It really was. You also got to be the announcer and the audience host for Dinah. And I know you've talked about Dinah Shore being one of your favorite people. There should be more people like Dinah. There should be more people like Dinah. She loved everybody. She really did. And she was able to show it, both off stage and on stage and backstage. She cared about everybody and everything. And it was a, you know, I was with her for 10 years. Well, it was eight, eight or 10 years. The audiences, re they loved her as a person, not as an entertainer. You know, she would sing on the show, of course, but that wasn't the big thing. The big thing, I think, was how she met and mingled with the biggest stars in the business. And she could get the biggest stars in the business on that show. Whoever was really hot at the time, they got on the Dinah show. And I think that her ability to deal with them like folks next door type thing, you know, on the air. And here she's talking to the biggest names in the business at the time. I think that's what endeared her for so long to the audiences. And what was it like for you to be on that set with the biggest celebrities of the time and just, you know, in one of the places to be at that time? Seventh Heaven. Really? <laughs> Seventh Heaven. You walked out on stage and you see people, my God, look over there, such and such, or this is such and such. The biggest names, you know. And uh, they're trying to remember how to do this or do that or, you know. How, they, how do they want to be introduced? I used to go over and talk to some of them, ask them if they had any particular thing that they liked, because I could change my introductions to them when I introduced them on stage a little bit. And if there was anything particular that they would like to have brought into it, if I could do it, I would. And I think that worked out very well. Was that the highlight of your career up until that point, would you say? <sighs> well, it certainly was one of them. There's no doubt about that. Uh, I don't know, honey. I have so many highlights over the years in my career that I don't know which one is better. Because each one was unto itself a special thing. You know, it was, it was a special thing. Uh, you don't think of them as one being better than the other or the other, you know. You just know how much you enjoyed it or how popular it was, how long it went on, the people that you would meet, know. Uh, uh, I don't. It's hard to class them one way or the other. I did the $25,000 pyramid for many years uh, with Bob Stewart, who created that. He also created The Price is Right, by the way. Uh, and he created the $25,000 pyramid. And we did a lot of shows, different types of shows together. That He was always building new shows, creating new shows, because he liked to do that. Uh, and... Once again, you meet a lot of people on that show. You, you just you're around them all the time. Uh, it's it's a pleasure. It's not work. God, it's anything but work, you know. And the audiences come in; they're eager to be entertained. They love the show. That's why they're there. I mean, you know, you're ahead already. At this point in your career, you're thinking, "I made the right choice." <laughs> oh, I think all and everything that I did, I did at the right time for the right purpose. I don't think there's anything that I can think of that stands out as a mistake. Not really. Not any of them. I loved everything that I did. That's the interesting thing about it. Most people go through business uh, or life in businesses they don't like or they're in a profession that they don't particularly care about. I love what I do and what I did so much that it was just, uh, everything was a pleasure. And I got to travel all around. You know, it was wonderful. You've had some pretty incredible friendships you've shared with me over the years, one of them being Betty White. Oh, God, yeah. Betty White. How did you guys first meet? On uh, $25,000 Pyramid. She and Bob Stewart were very close friends. Bob was the creator of the show, and they were very close friends. So whenever there was a party or anything, uh, I was always invited to it, and Betty was always there. And we got to be really good friends. And then for my 60th birthday, Sherry set up a surprise party on a yacht, one of the big um, uh, yachts here in the um, basin that you can rent in the marina. Well, she set up a surprise, and I didn't know about it. And all these people showed up, uh, Wink Martindale, all of the guys that I'd worked with for so long, over at different shows and things like that. that uh, and Betty was there. And... Uh, 
it, what a wonderful pleasure to, just to see all of them as a surprise. You, you cry. You can't help it, you know. And Betty and I, uh, we'd had a couple of drinks, and we were dancing together to the band, <laughs> to, to, to the DJ on the boat. It just Those are wonderful memories, you know. And the parties that I would go to, Bob Stewart always had Christmas parties, and uh, sometimes even during the summer he would have a party. And uh, Betty would be among the group all the time. So, you know, you just, and she was, <laughs> she was everything they say she was, and and more. Absolutely. One of the shows that was kind of a departure from your usual show, Supermarket Sweep. <laughs> well, it was a game show. It was a game show. It really was. Uh, and, you know, I've done a ton of them over the years, as we know. Uh, we've mentioned a few, but I've done a lot more. You know, anything for money, or people will really do anything for money. Uh, that was true. I did that with Wink Martindale. But uh, Supermarket Sweep was a thing unto itself <laughs> because I had never, ever, nobody had ever seen anything like that. That's never saw anything like that in your life. Running around, as I've said many times in the audiences, you've heard me say it, running around in the supermarket, grabbing everything they can get their hands on, and going up to the checkout counter, and the people that had grabbed the most and it added up to the most money, won. And that was what it was, basically. And people loved it. I mean, you've announced for award shows, game shows, cartoons, sitcoms, theme park attractions, you name it, we've heard your voice yep. somewhere. Somewhere, yeah. And probably will for many years on after I'm gone. You'll still hear my voice because they're on shows, and as long as there's syndication, they'll get them out and run them again. You know, for a person who's had a career that has had so many different twists and turns and so many things you've been a part of, I have to think that the biggest chapter certainly lands at Jeopardy and that call you received back in 1984 to be a part of what would become such an iconic role for you. Who had any idea? We had no idea. Alex uh, signed for 13 weeks, and in order to do it, he signed on as a producer as well as the host. He would do both jobs. Uh, Merv wanted it that way. And, and Merv hired me because uh, we had met him before in various ways. And so when it started up, uh, Alex and I had become really kind of good friends, even though we'd never worked together, because when I was doing something uh, over on NBC, he was doing something, and we would meet in the uh, lounge sometimes or passing in the halls, and we got to be friends, you know, and we had mutual friends. Uh, but I had never worked with him. And I frankly was uh, delighted when they mentioned my name as being possible to be on the show, even though we knew it was a 13-week show. But all game shows start out as 13 weeks. So that's the way it is. That's the, the life of the show in the beginning. So when they decided to hire me, and I think Alex had a lot to do with it, but it was 13 weeks, 13 weeks. The set, the set was made up of neon tubes. That's what the Jeopardy set was. And when they finished, we finished taping, then they'd break it all down and stick it over in the corner so they could do something else on the stage. That's how it started out, over on Channel 11, as a matter of fact. And all these years later, Johnny, you are the only member of that original Jeopardy staff and crew. Yep. Yep. That's kind of scary. <laughs> but it's true. It's true, yeah. And, uh, gosh, I don't know. It's been... It's... The, the rest of my life is there. Talk about the Jeopardy family that you have now been a part of for more than 38 years. That's a good word. Family is a good word. And I guess that's true with all shows. I don't know, but it seems so true. The, the thing about Jeopardy's family, uh, and had it been for so many years, is that the show was so popular. So it's a special thing. It's a spe That's why so many of our members, crew members are still with us many, many, many years later. They're still with us. I'm a rookie, Johnny, and I've been here for 21 years. <laughs> that's right. That's right. And you're, a, yeah, yeah, you you just got here. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know how the staff is. And they're wonderful people because it's a bright show. It's a smart show. Everybody's interested. You watch the show when we're actually doing it. You know this better than I do or as well. Uh, you watch, look around at the crew. They're all listening to the show. They're all trying to come up with the responses in their minds. On other game shows, that's not what happens. 
it's it's a it's a it's a learning thing all the time. People are always trying to learn something. Even if you're on the staff, you're listening to the material, listening to Alex. And of course, the difference with Alex was doing was you know, he didn't make any mistakes. <laughs> if he made a mistake, it was a rarity. You know that absolutely. He never used cue cards or anything like that. That because it was in in him. I remember one day he came out on stage. I introduced him, and he came out on stage, and he said. I don't know what the hell I'm going to say. <laughs> <laughs> and he turned around and walked back off stage. And we were all in a state of shock. I know. We know. He never did that. That doesn't happen. <laughs> but he did, he did it. I was there. You know, so yes, it's a special thing. And a wonderful thing for me in my career. God. How about the time he came out without pants on, Johnny? Do you remember that one? Oh, I remember it well, yeah. It was about the second day, uh, second or third day of the game, I think. And they were just having, he, we used to, he sat backstage, you know that, in front of his dressing room in those chairs. Yep. And we'd come out and we'd talk about it. And he just, I think the contestants seem awfully uptight, don't you think? And we all agreed, you know, yeah, they did. They weren't, seemed to be having any fun. They were so hell-bent on winning against each other. That there was, there was, there was no levity, no, uh, I, I, I don't know what you'd say, uh, no fun there. And I didn't know he was going to do it, by the way. None of us did. He, but, no, no but one he knew. just mentioned that backstage, and we all agreed. Yeah, they are. They, I don't know. They don't look like having any fun. And, but I knew it was on his mind. I figured, well, he would tell some kind of joke or something, do something, you know, humorous, say something humorous, maybe to get him to smile a little bit before he got into the show. So when I introduced him, uh, of course, I had finished my introduction by the time I saw him, or I would never have gotten through the introduction. <laughs> There's no doubt about it. Uh, yes, that was once in a <laughs> lifetime thing. Well, I think it was Ken Jennings, Brad Rutter, and Jerome Verrid, and it is still one of their highlights. Just not something you see every day. <laughs> no, you certainly don't. And not from the again. consummate professional Alex Trebek, for sure. You guys had such a fun relationship. Um, I loved the way he would joke with you and give you a hard time, especially about not needing yeah. glasses. That just drove him crazy that at your age, you still didn't need reading glasses, Johnny Gilbert. Yeah, and I still and I still don't. <laughs> <laughs> Unbelievable. It really was. It really, how do you read that, he would say. How can you read that without glasses? <laughs> yeah, that bothered him. I know. But he was wonderful. He really was. And when he went up to play golf with me at his club, at my club, rather, he was so good, so kind, so trying to be helpful. And every, a different side of Alex that uh, was really a pleasure to be around, to be, to know, you know, riding around in a cart with him. So those are good things, things to think of. You've done some fun categories on the show over the years, you know, even this season. And it is always a highlight when we introduce a Johnny Gilbert category. <laughs> yeah, and I always worry about them that they're not going to be any good. And that's a fun thing, they really are. And once again, it points out the another heart. This show has so many hearts, but another big heart. And every time, if I sit and watch it tonight, one thing that will come into my mind, my God, how do those writers do it? Mm-hmm. That always comes to my mind. They just come up with the most amazing things. They put them in the right order as far as degrees of difficulty most of the time. Uh, their the variety, after all of this time, variety. 38 years later, you want the writers to give you variety? I mean, that's just unbelievable. I agree. The best of the best. Now, how did the satin jackets come about, Johnny? Because I don't, I mean, if I see you without a satin jacket on it, it just seems wrong because I've seen you in so many for so many years. How did that first come about? Did you know Alex gave me a jacket with Jeopardy on it? For, I don't know, it was Christmas or what it was many, many years ago. And I wore it on the show. Had Jeopardy. I thought that was good. I'm the announcer. I want to see who I am, what I'm doing. And everybody loved it. They said, God, that's great. Where'd you get that jacket? Everybody wanted to buy a jacket. <laughs> Where'd you get that jacket? Where you can buy? Where can you buy one of those? So then I had a bunch of them made up, different colors and different things over the years. Well, I never knew. See, I'm learning things today too, Johnny. Some of the simplest things start. Some of the best things start out the simplest ways. I don't think Alex had any thought of me actually wearing the show during all the shows, wearing the jacket during all the shows. I don't think they had that in mind at all. Talking about accomplishments, along the lines, you get a Guinness world record for the longest career as a game show announcer on a single show. 
That's correct. And the interesting thing about it is I break my record every time the show goes on the air again. As a matter of fact, you know, Alex won it, of course, for his hosting Yeah. before I won mine. And he said one day to me, he says, I wonder when they're going to update these things. <laughs> Because, you know, they they set it for the dates that, that that it happened then. Yeah. And since then, he kept on hosting and I kept on announcing. So you just kept breaking the record every day. You know, so often contestants say, when they hear Johnny Gilbert say their name, what a moment that is for them. It's like the culmination of their dream to hear your voice announce their name. What does it mean to you to know that that's the impact you have on people's lives just by saying their name? I don't know. It's uh, uh, To me, I'm in, trying to get it right, as you know. You help me with that all the time. Uh, but for them, I guess for the voice that has introduced so many people, so many famous winners, if you will, mm -hmm. uh, it is something to have your name be introduced. I guess that's what it is. Yeah, well, it, it means a lot to them. It's pretty incredible to see their face the first time they hear you say their name. I, it, it never gets old, Johnny. No, I guess it doesn't. I get it. Thank God. That's good for that. That's good. The ma email I get expresses that too. They just wonderful letters I get from people. You know, and when back back when Alex was answering them, you know, yeah, sometimes it would be to Alex, and then also would you ask Johnny? Said so Alex would <laughs> sign off for whatever he wanted to, and then send it over to me uh, with a note. Uh, Johnny, answer this, would you? Why do you think that Jeopardy has been? so successful for all these years what's what's the secret oh that's a big question isn't it you can say all of the normal things you know it's a good show it's well constructed merv griffin did an incredible job of putting it together and, and the history of even how it came together to putting it material in the form of a question you know uh, you where you answer in the form of a question you know things like that just how it all kind of fell into place but I think it's I think it's popular because people some people want to see really bright people. They want to see people that know things. They want to see how they react, what they do, and so forth. And the other thing is they want to see how much they know, how much they can remember sitting at home. When a contestant misses, he said, "I know that. I know that." And you know, it's a personal thing for people that watch it. How much can I guess? How much can I get right? I think that has a lot to do with it. Yeah. And as I said, Alex's wonderful pr presence has just made it all so smooth to roll along with. Is there anything I haven't asked, Johnny, that you wanted to share or talk about or anything I left off? Well, you've covered it pretty good, Sarah. Very good, as a matter of fact. You reminded me of certain places that I'd even forgotten about over the years, and it's good to have those back again. Uh, no, I think that... The one thing that I am humbled by is that I meet people that find out who I am. Not that I tell them, but they find out some other way. Or the fan mail comes in. And they say how much I've helped them. How much I've helped them in their lives. Thank you, Johnny. And I don't know what I did. I just was Johnny. I just did the announcing. I, I talked to the people. Uh, but, you know, people were in the audience, and I get letters from them after they've gone back home about how much uh, I helped them in their life, and I don't know how I did that. I'm glad they think that, and I'm glad they feel that way about it, uh, but I, I I really don't know how. God gave me a, a strong throat and the ability to use it. Um, can't ask for more than that. Well, and the rest of us have just been lucky that you've shared it with us all these years. Thank you, Sarah.